Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, discussion here. And very warm welcome to the Hippo AI uh, Data and AI Health Summit. Um, and today's topic is, um, does the rise of uh, open source AI need new licensing framework? So that's the first question we are posing. And uh, before we get into the topic, uh, uh, let's have a, a small introduction from each uh, uh, one of the panelists. So starting from maybe uh, Danish, uh, and then alphabetically we'll go uh, towards uh, the uh, last is Stefano. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Uh, thank you, Srikant, for the invitation. Uh, so my background is in um, NLP, question answering, dialogue systems, and such. Uh, more recently, I've been the chair of the Responsible AI Licensing Initiative, and I've been also working on allied initiatives such as the IEEE SAP 2840, which is trying to define uh, a standard around responsible AI licensing. I served as the co-chair of the Model Governance Working Group for Big Science, um, and, and looking forward to the conversation here today. Thank you. Great. Um, hi everyone, I'm Han Ling, uh, Han Ling Li. Uh, I, my research is very much focusing on the governance of data and human computer interaction. Um, I was fortunate to work with Danish on the responsible AI licensing work. And, uh, and I should also mention that I'm a freshly minted PhD going to be a postdoc post scholar at UC Berkeley. Thanks all. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Luis Villa. I am a uh, developer turned attorney. I have been working in the open source space for a very long time. I led the drafting of Mozilla Public License version 2, was Wikipedia's uh, main uh, negotiator on Creative Commons license version 4. I've been involved in more other uh, open source license drafting processes than I can fit in one tweet. So, uh, and I'm currently helping out a little bit with some AI licensing projects. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Nick Vincent. Uh, I just recently also defended my PhD at Northwestern, and I'm getting ready to go to a postdoc at, uh, at UC Davis and with folks at University of Washington. And my work is, is all about uh, data leverage. So I'm very excited about the idea that people, that folks who create and generate data can uh, engage in collective action and kind of have more leverage over downstream models. Um, and so I think that that's going to be, that's the angle I'll be bringing to the conversation today. I think it's a, a really powerful frame uh, and uh, really exciting for the potential of data licensing to support that cause. Thank you. And I'm Stefano Maffulli. I'm the executive director of the Open Source Initiative, which is the organization that stewards the open source definition, the list of criteria that define what uh, rights need to be attached to software when uh, as a user. Uh, and I've been in this position for a little over a year, but I've, I'm a long time open source contributor and, and student. <laughs> I'm humbling watching the, the, the space I've been for, for a long time. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm Srikant. Uh, I, um, currently I am a fellow at uh, Center for Advanced Internet Studies in, here in Germany. Uh, and I'm also working with BART um, on uh, policy and uh, regulatory issues uh, for uh, Hippo AI. Um, that's that's my background, current work, and uh, uh, from uh, uh, five years for five years now, I've been focusing on digital policy and governance, uh, particularly on uh, global south, how digital development is uh, uh, panning out in global south, and how uh, this is uh, either. Uh, 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 f promoting innovation or uh, uh, or, or exacerbating uh, uh, divide data divide. That's my uh, that has been my focus. But now I'm more um, more focusing on uh, uh, AI and uh, open source um, data commons and uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, that's that's my background. Thank you. And uh, as for uh, today's topic, uh, so uh, the first round of, uh, let's say, uh, we'll take first uh, uh, round of remarks from each one of the panel, uh, again, uh, starting from Danish. And uh, um, does the rise of um, uh, open source AI need new licensing frameworks? So that's the uh, question I'm posing to the panel now. Yeah. Over to you, Danish. Thanks, Srikant. So um, in my opinion, the answer, short answer to that is a yes. Um, I think um, given how um, 
So you could argue on one end that AI is the same as just regular software. There's no difference between traditional software that we've seen over the last couple of decades and how AI is today. But in my opinion, uh, while that's true, there are also certain things we need to take care of just by the way in which at least modern machine learning and, and deep learning based AI systems function, which brings in a lot of unpredictability um, arising from a lot of different sources, which need to be accounted for when we're thinking about use and, and dissemination of such um, AI systems. And, and we can go into more details as as the panel progresses. Thank you. Uh, Anlin? Um, my answer to that question is also yes, uh, and kind of adding on what Danish mentioned here earlier, um, my idea of this is the reason we need this is that also considering the scale of the AI technologies we have today, whereas historically when we think about open source software, it's very much like much larger scale compared with today's foundation models, large language models. Uh, so to, put, to help to um, somewhat mitigate this model's impact on local communities, I do think we need licensing that is much, very much customized to social norms. Yeah, Louis? Oh boy, I, I, I mean, I, I agree, yes, but I, I would love to unpack that last statement about licensing connected to social norms, right? Because we have regulatory models connected to social norms, we call them governments. And uh, we, um, you know, I think there's a there's a great temptation in this space. Open source traditionally has gone very far in one direction, right? Which is we minimize the restrictions in order for everybody to do whatever they can. The temptation to write all of human rights law, torts law, criminal law into a license is very understandable uh and which is not to say we don't again not to say we don't need new licensing models here because if nothing else the traditional tools a copyright law may or may not apply patent law may may or may not apply so we're going to need new licenses of some sort um but whether or not we can then replicate all human social norms within the context of an intellectual property license is a is a, a very complex question that we could easily spend the whole panel on. Yeah. Um, and, and to be clear, I think it's a, I think one of the things that is challenging is that the intuitions that we had, it's not just the licensing models we had, it's the intuitions we've had and honed from 25 years of, of open source are probably, maybe not entirely wrong, but definitely yeah. uh, a lot of those intuitions are incorrect. And, and so I think uh, we need to relearn them, whether they're whether they end up embodied in licensing or governments or what have you, is a is a different question. Yeah, yeah. Um, once I think we have um, uh, the other two panelists uh, uh, give their remarks, maybe we uh, we can discuss more on how you view um, you know uh, the open uh, uh, licenses, like let's say the new license rail. Um, uh, which which uh, Danish and uh, Hanlin can give us more uh, uh, on that, how they are seeing it to pan out in the uh, in the new versions, and uh, the concerns what you have. I think you expressed few of them on your blog, uh, Louis. So yeah, so we'll we'll discuss more about uh, uh, the new licensing mechanisms. Yeah, uh, how about uh, you, Nick? Um, how about your views? Yeah, so I, I think I'm gonna. I should have also mentioned that I, I've I've been working on uh, with the Rail folks as well. So uh, I, my my opinions are shared there to a great degree with with, with Hanlin and, and Danish. Um, the comment that I wanted to add, however, is I think that there is a argument for licensing that that's pretty unique or a, a thing that's very different between someone developing a let's say a text editor and there's a developer out there somewhere and they're kind of using a license to uh, control their interactions with a bunch of users. Right? It's kind of like a one to many relationship. Whereas with something like a search engine or a large language model or the generative AI art models that have been really dominating the headlines now is that every user is, is interacting with each other at the, the million person scale. So everyone who's using the search engine is having downstream effects on other users of the search engines mediated via, via the data, via the training data or the test data in some case. Um, and I think that this is, this is just very new and different and weird. And we're just ill prepared to even think about this, let alone, uh, you know, legislated or, or, um, govern it. And so th that's kind of like a, a very central frame that I think calls for the need for unique data licensing, for why data licensing is going to be different than, than other kinds of licensing, especially in the open source context. 
Yeah, and I tend to agree with uh, with the views expressed here. It, in general, I, I would say that we need new uh, licenses that are specifically targeting this new the space because it is different than the software that we have experienced so far. Uh, simple things like the concept of source code don't necessarily or don't easily map to any of the artifacts of machine learning tools and, 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 and systems. And, and there is also the variety and, and the, 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 kind, the fact that architectures of uh, machine learning systems are, are, are not static. They, they keep on changing, like Nick was saying, the, the, the changes, the influences of models being, the models being influenced by, by usage, by new data coming in. All of that needs to take it, be taken into account. And I, but I, I think also that the, the, the concept need, needs to be expanded. Like Louis slightly touched on it. The fact that we need, we need new frameworks uh, does not mean that we need to throw away what we have um, experienced so far. Uh, actually, it would be very good to build on top of the experience that we already have um, and, and, um, and, and change our assumptions. Like I'm sure that the, uh, the, in, the, the, the intuitions uh, that, um, that <laughs> Louis referred to, um, they, they, can be, they can be reused. They need to be adapted though. I mean, uh, rather than say they're not correct, they, they, uh, I would say that they, they need to be adapted to the new technology. Uh, and Louis, you want, yeah, can, yeah, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, I think some Nick maybe unintentionally got at something that's really critical here and very important for the hippo community. Um, the licensing, we have tended in open source to have one license that, that serves many different roles, right? It licenses the source code, licenses the binary, serves as a community governance tool. Um, you know, other things get layered on top of that, but at the end of the day, there's one license um, because the source code is the artifact that matters. There are many different artifacts with different appropriate techniques in the AI space, right? The licensing for the data is related to, but very distinct from the licensing for the model. Um, and, you know, and what, and, and, a, and a licensing, you know, if, if you tell me the license for the model, okay, well, but if I don't know the license for the data, like I actually have a very incomplete picture, whereas for an open source community, a traditional open source community, if you tell me the software, you've told me like, the software license, you've told me like 90% of what I need to know, right? Um, and so I think that is, you know, Stefano, to your point, that is one of those intuitions that I, I actually recently told a group of open source lawyers that they are the world's preeminent crafters of square pegs and this is a round hole <laughs> and they need to you know there there needs to be some humility i think uh as this as there is a well-established community of open source licensed lawyers uh, but we need to have humility approaching this problem space because it is a very different problem space yeah. and uh, um so how do you see uh, the the new licensing frameworks are the existing ones fostering um, the the data solidarity right so we talk about data solidarity when it comes to open um, commons um, uh, as as uh, as uh, i think uh, louis uh, uh, blog uh, has open commons that's that's a, a phrase i would like to use here so how do you uh, see you know um, the the whole uh, these licenses either foster or don't foster uh, the data solidarity. So that's one question I would like to put to, um, uh, uh, you know, who is working on uh, human AI interaction, uh, somebody like, I think maybe uh, Hanlin or Nick want to, wants to take it. Um, yeah, I can start. Um, so <laughs> I think I have some ideas on this. Uh, I so my work has been focusing on like how can we put a like, assess like what is the subsidy the data subsidy a lot of for example for profit entities are getting from like Wikipedia Foundation or getting from open soft softwares uh, because they're heavily relying on this information to train the models to just run their business in general. Um, I I haven't approached this question from the licensing approach. The way that I'm thinking is we need to account for this kind of economic inequity that where larger players are extracting value from these public comments or uh, 
from this public good without paying a fair price. Uh, and now bringing back to licensing, I do think licensing has the potential to mitigate some part of this. Um, so there was some noise, I think. I think it's gone now. Okay. Uh, sorry. Go, yeah, going back to licensing, um, I do think there's ways that f I don't think licensing could could mitigate the financial inequity, but I do think the licensing could help to uh, rebalance, for example, like or setting some norms around what are the appropriate uses of these public comments, rather than right now where we can use this information for whatever um, these larger players wanted. So that's my yeah, that's my immediate reaction to that. Great, uh, Nick. About yeah, I, I would uh, you know just agree with, with all of that wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm pretty excited by the potential. I think that uh, having a community around licensing allows for pretty, relatively speaking, low cost collective action. So right now you could argue that the way that people select licenses for their, um, you know, their GitHub repositories represents a kind of collective action that they are supporting or voting for the, the values or the, the principles like enacted in a particular license. And you see a lot of Obviously, it, it's pretty popular to just like look at your favorite repos and if pick whatever license they, they picked, right? And you, you just put that on your um, open source software or your like little script or, or whatever it might be, whether it's a big project or a small project. There's all sorts of like interesting herding and flocking behaviors that you could kind of, you know, study it ecologically. But um, I think that we could see something sim very similar happen around data licensing, where if there are, if it's very easy to say, like, you know, I really want to support medical causes, but I really don't want to support facial recognition, yeah. right? Um, if it's if it's easy to do that, if it's easy to put you know that license on my data, and if there's a community of people who are doing that, so I, I follow them really easily, you could imagine people kind of emergently building these these collective action movements, but without really spending much effort at all, right? It just it just takes a click. It, it's very um, there's there's thought involved, and there's a lot of like organizing needed, but the actual resources needed to like um, scaffold the collective action eventually, if, if we work towards it, they become very low. And I think that's great. And that, that that kind of makes collective action easier than it is in like an offline context. Yep. Um, Stefano, you have anything to offer here? Any new perspectives? Or, uh... Well, you know, I, 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 I love to hear, I've been talking with the past year with the Open Source Initiative uh, a lot with, with people who are doing AI machine learning because it, it's not my field. I mean, yeah, and, and I wanted to know more. And I noticed that there is a lot of um, requests from the practitioners about these this, this challenges, these thoughts about the misuses, uh, the possible misuses of AI and, and how things can get out of hand and, and, and um, how these this large uh, collections of pictures of content in general uh, can, can be used for nefarious purposes. And I, I heard a lot of these comments 20 years ago and plus, 20 plus years ago, uh, when uh, um, software was being def shared and, and, and we were advocating, we started to advocate for software to be used as a comment. And, and you know, there, there is a way, for example, there, there's a lot of software that can be used for nefarious purposes. And the reason why the open source definition does not block, does not prevent uh, uh, field of use is because practically, uh, there is no easy way or there is no possible way of, of blocking nefarious uses. And um, also because these nefarious uses, this definition can be various in time, uh, culture, uh, uh, cannot be enforced globally. And, and, and so the, the, out, the, 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 the balance of, of um, or uh, yeah, now I'm lacking the word in English, uh, blanking out. But the, yeah, you know, so it, 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 get, it can get complicated and, and the trade-offs uh, um, between, between creating these, these uh, little um, partitions where you want to use only pictures, not for uh, face recognition, but for something else, needs that you adding friction to the, to the producing the comments or generating the comments. You're, you're adding barriers so that people need to come and ask for permission. And you're basically creating a, pl a path uh, that is not linear, that is not used, and, and you're beating your, your purpose of creating the, the comments. There is that you, danger you, to be aware of. Yeah, I, I love Nick's emphasis on collective action. I mean, that's been a through line of, for both Stefano and I in our careers, right? Um, but the... Uh, 
it, capitalism also has ways of creating collective action. Uh, and if you're, uh, you know, I mean, I was talking with somebody just earlier today about some data set licensing and they're like, well, uh, we don't really like this open license. So we'll just go buy this data that we need. Right. Um, if you're, so there can be, as Stefano says, friction there that, uh, is, uh, you know, that, that ends up being counterproductive, especially as you further splinter a big commons, right? Like uh, the advantage of something like a Wikipedia uh, is by being, you know, mostly value neutral on who uses it, it does grow that pie to a larger size that everyone can benefit from, which isn't to say this is necessarily a wrong thing of aiming for some smaller commons, uh, but it is, uh, I think, uh, there's a benefit to those things that's that are uh that we sometimes easily forget about when we focus on the negative I, you know the other thing i think that's interesting here we focus very much on the licensing um but it, you know real commons have much more active ways of sharing norms sharing uh uh enforcing norms i, I think it is just as important in this space we we tend to forget in open source because the licenses tend to be mostly unenforced. Uh, and in fact, there, speaking of capitalism, there's a lot of people who like it that the licenses are unenforced. Um, you know, we don't talk very much about what enforcement could look like, should look like, who should do the enforcement. You know, I think I'm not a, a super expert in where Hippo is and where Hippo thinks it's going, but to hear, you know, to hear an organization thinking proactively about what it means to do these kinds of not just rule setting, but rule enforcing, rule creation as an integrated whole, I think is super interesting. And I, I can't wait to see more about what comes out of that, right? Because I think if we just set up, and I've said this to Denise as well, that uh, if we, if we, merely publish a license without also thinking very hard about what enforcement might look like, then we will have missed an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Danish, uh, you, uh, you have, uh, you, you, are, you, you are one of the key members of uh, our chair, maybe, yeah. you are chair of uh, um, Open Rail. So how um, are you distinguishing um, source code, data sets, and the ML model, right? So three components of uh, AI ecosystem. So how do you see uh, the licensing is emerging in these three and then how communities are kind of uh, uh, shaping them. Uh, do you have uh, any insight to offer? Sure, thanks. So I, I, before that, I also just wanted to touch upon something that both Luis and Stefano uh, referred to, right? So what is it that, that has changed? I think in the past when we were licensing data, um, it wasn't so much for training machine learning model. It was also a means of sharing information, right? Like if you look at 20 years ago when you're sharing, open sharing was was inherently good or associated with good just because it was sharing information. But today how information is used is a big function of, in at least in machine learning, it's basically data, right? And if, if for instance, five years ago or 10 years ago, I could have shared without thinking too much about an alternative history of of the world, right, of the United States and make it look like what would history textbooks look like today if, um, if X or Y or Z had not happened. Now, that would have been more a literary endeavor or maybe, uh, you know, just just f history fan endeavor uh, as opposed to something that today could be used to create an alternative history of the world at scale for machine learning and then generate realistic looking things that, that could be used for misinformation, right? Or you could even use this, for example, there's this there was a system that was doing diplomacy uh, and and navigating how international relations could be with with an alter with, with some 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 background in facts right now imagine that's it's it, it, it would today if things are becoming more indis indistinguishable it's only because of of data right of, of the generative capabilities of models that we've got and that is why i think at the point of origin we're starting to think about use right so I think 30 years ago, if you weren't thinking about use, it was because maybe they weren't different as there weren't as many uses as possible of the same artifacts. Today we have to because things have changed. So that that brings us to you know what we're thinking about licensing of AI. Like you said, there are different components to what goes into an AI system. How was it trained? What data did you use? 
were you allowed to use the data? Like what were the what were the what were the properties of the data set? Um, what were the restrictions that came on the data set? What were how was the data collected? For what purpose was it collected from a privacy point of view? Um, that's that's data, right? That's 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 one uh, one one part of the data licensing uh, aspects. The the other bit is around modeling. Um, when we typically associated software, we said, you know, there's a binary, there's a source code, you know, and, and that's what we really thought of software. Um, but today we have this thing in the middle, which is also ill-defined, right, which is, which is what we call weights in a, in a machine learning system. Um, you've got these model parameters. It's not clear whether they're copyrightable. I don't think that's been well established, uh, or maybe it has, I'm not sure. Um, but, but, but you could argue one way or the other, because the community tends to be licensing models um, under open source, right? So there is this implicit assumption that they can be licensed. If they can't be licensed, that's that's a very that's that's a completely alternative dimension question, right? Can you even license a model? Um, but if the community assumes that you can, uh, which is the assumption that everybody has been making, and that's how people have been using models, then the question then becomes, what is what does it mean to be a what does it mean to derive something out of a model? If I add, you know, there was, um, I was reading some Twitter thread where somebody was criticizing the whole notion of uh, mm -hmm. relicensing, um, uh, like there is, what is the notion of a derivative work for a model and, and, and like one of the, the open rail, uh, one of the open rail licenses that, uh, that we worked on has a clause that, you know, even if you fine tune or, or distill or rebuild a model, you still have to include the usage restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular conversation was really criticizing that whole notion and, you know, um, and the reason why that's there is because if, for instance, I add the, um, a simple uh, identity function as a top layer, have I modified that enough uh, to be different from the original model? I don't know if there is a precedent for what is transformative work for a model, right? I know there is some interpretations of transformative work for text, for even for software, maybe somewhat subjective, but for model weights, where does that transformation really stop? And if, if you take that argument even further, you could maybe even start arguing that a model is nothing but a transformation of the data itself, in which case, what are you even licensing? I mean, these are questions that will be set up by precedents of law and, you know, like, I, I, and maybe Luis is, is probably the best one to even um, <laughs> and, and think about what these are here, right? But, but yes, things have changed and um, there are certain things that the community is trying. Um, it, it may not be perfect, but it's, but status quo is not something that we can continue with, right? And it's, I think, that's something we have to evolve um, as a community and, and move forward with. Um, yeah, more questions than, than answers, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, I have happen. so, oh yeah, way more questions than answers. I, I, I want to interject yeah. real quick, a couple things. Like, so one, I, I do want to push back on this notion that open source has not been, I mean, open source is in tanks, is in bombs, uh, is in extremely racist uh, software. Uh, you know, uh, for things like um, sentencing and, and racial profiling. So these problems are not, I, I want to push malware. back. Malware, don't forget these, malware. <laughs> oh, all kinds of malware, right? Like, I want to push back on the notion that these problems are new. I think there are lessons to be learned from the past on that. Uh, but two, that said, I'm extremely, you know, to what Nick said about collective action, I think it's lovely and refreshing and and such a good sign that the AI community is thinking very actively about these problems, right? Like, I think that is uh, something that has, for a variety of reasons, uh, has been sort of lost in the wash in free and open source over the past 20 years. It has become a much less ethically aligned movement over time. And I think that's a shame that that was lost. And I'm very excited to see that coming back again. The third thing, though, and this is where, you know, Denise, I think this is where the... Um, we can't just hand wave these problems with licensing uh, because the um, you know, one sure way to break the collective action, the positive wave of collective action that we see right now is if these licenses turn out to be deeply legally flawed and bad people exploit those legal flaws, then the community is going to say, oh, well, that sucks, right? And that's going to be a big blow uh, for that community. And so I think it's really important for us to take seriously these kinds of critiques of, because I don't think that if we're thinking about the same Twitter thread, uh, you know, I, the critique was not of the attempt to like controlling the licensing of the derivative age old idea and open source, good idea. 
uh, or at least at least an accepted idea. So works in some cases, doesn't work in others. Um, but if the legal toolkit for it isn't there, right? Like if legally the platform, if the legal platform doesn't support that behavior, then bad people are going to exploit it. And, and I think, and that's going to cause a crisis of trust and confidence in uh, this whole concept of can we even, which is why, again, to that point I was making earlier, how do we enforce these? How do we adapt these? Because all this stuff is, it's not good to be writing licenses. And this is a real challenge for, for the rail folks, of which I'm slowly becoming one, uh, is that, you know, how do we write a license now that still makes sense in six months when, when the whole field is moving so fast, right? Um, I, I don't know, Nick, do you have some yeah. thoughts on that? You're, you smile and a big smile at it. Yeah, I do. I mean, it basically, you, you kind of preempted exactly what I wanted to add, which is that a huge, a huge, like the core problem here, or the core problem with the moment that we're in right now is that there's all these uses that nobody thought of when they were creating the data. So speaking specifically to data licensing, um, you would imagine that someone would want to pick data. They, they want to, they, they're going to create some data. They're going to edit a Wikipedia article, create medical records that they, or they co-create medical records with their physician, um, maybe as part of a study. Uh, they're going to upload art onto the internet or they're going to write a tweet, right? All these things are, are data creation. Um, and presumably, if I'm going to try to pick a license for that data, which in some cases is, is restricted, if I am going to edit Wikipedia, Wikipedia already has a license for all the content. And so I don't, I don't have any say right now. Um, but maybe in the other context, I do. I, I want to know what's the data going to be used for. That's like the probably, you know, the, the top thing that would influence how I license it. But how could I possibly know? If I was putting code onto GitHub in 2017, how could I know that GitHub Copilot would come out and use the, the code that I wrote to help, you know, do AI programming, uh, so to speak, you know, AI in, in scare quotes, if you will. Um, and, and we're seeing that right now, week by week, the new capabilities are coming out. And so we have to be, we have to remain flexible because I think that peop, the thing that people are going to care about most is what are these downstream uses I should be concerned about? And well, we can't tell you. We can't tell you what it's going to be six months from now. But we could at least, you know, make a good guess. And we'll keep updating those guesses as we go. Yeah. So here, uh, um, the Hippo AI uh, thinking on licensing comes uh, uh, into play because, um, as you said, collective action and, uh, you know, the downstream effects of the licensing uh, framework. So uh, Hippo AI thinking is, uh, uh, you know, um, the obligation on, uh, on, the, on the downstream users to open up further, right? So even um, uh, the modified models, or, or you modify uh, the training models also. Uh, once you modify, you should be, uh, you know, uh, you should be um, uh, um, opening up for uh, uh, further usage and further uh, deployment. So that's the idea, one side. And the other side is community should govern, as you uh, said, uh, Louis. Actually, the community has more responsibility to. Uh, govern the norms rather than you know uh, licensing uh, licenses are, uh, are are reposing. That's one uh, idea. But yeah, um, uh, but I I, I I want to hear uh, on this uh, uh, because community versus uh, the license uh, imposition from the license, right? So so how do you self-governed uh, methods and the uh, license-based uh, imposition? So how uh, these two work? Uh, because uh, now. We have another lawsuit, uh, uh, as, as Nick mentioned just briefly about Copilot, so where uh, you have uh, uh, the whole community's work has been appropriated uh, by Microsoft and the, uh, uh, and the lawsuit is pending now. So, so how do you see all these things you know, um, uh, in, in the new open uh, AI regime? Can I add some, something also analogy here, since Nick brought up the uh, open AI uh, class action suit? Uh, so another analogy I have constantly I keep relying on is that as a writer, for example, like going into this copyright issue, writers publish their content on platforms, and then platforms are sometimes obligated to like pursue misuses of this content. Uh, so I was curious, maybe this is more of a throwing a question out there. Is there anything we can learn from the copyright side uh, where we can help to enforce, for example, lic licensing on community like community that provide? Yeah. Um, uh, do you have anything to offer, uh, uh, Danish? Uh. I think that's that's more of a, a Luis question, but I think um, yeah, maybe I'll just defer to Luis <laughs> on that one. <laughs> 
Oh man, I I could go into that one for a while. I think I uh, um yeah, I I wouldn't even know where to start, honestly. Um, uh, you know, I I think all this stuff uh where we come we keep coming back to these questions of how do you how do norms and the licenses intersect, right? Uh and I posted in chat and hopefully uh the when we publish this it will be able to be linked. There's a paper from David Witter at CMU on how uh on a deep investigation of a deep fakes community and how their license interacts with their community norms and, and the strengths and limitations of that approach. And I think that that is, um, you know, I think, I think we're going to have to do a lot of that kind of development, right? Uh, that, that's dis, that's deliberate and going beyond the licensing. Uh, the, the, there's a, uh, community called the Hippocratic license community or ethical licensing community. And they have a notion of a governance stack, right? Of which the license is just one part. And I think we're going to have to see more of that kind of, that kind of thing. Does that answer your question, Helen? Or do you want to? Yeah, maybe kind of unpack a little. I'm more thinking of like, we talked about earlier, like the problem with enforcing licensing. Uh, like we don't have, like it has to be, I have to have the resource to pursue at legal action if I want to someone violate my license. Uh, whereas thinking of like a writer analogy where again, like the platform are equipped with the resources to advocate on behalf of the writers. Is there yeah. any similar in initiatives or structure in that within that we can learn from uh, like yeah, that's... oh yeah, I see, I see where you're getting at now. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem has been that historically, the big platform in, in the code space, distinct from writing, and, and I'll get to that in a second. In the code space, the incentives for the platforms are everyone should use this as widely as possible. Right. Um, and uh, and and I can't speak for Hugging Face, but I assume, you know, they're not here, but I would assume that in the long run, they also want maximum possible usage of this as a as a business incentive for them. Right. Where writers, uh, content creators of a variety of sorts outside of software and Nick, this gets to your collective action thing. Labor power is a is a thing we do not talk about at all in tech. And uh, I think is something that we, you know, what would a uh, union for <laughs> for data creators look like, right? What would a, uh, you know, or we, we talk often about these days about unionizing in tech, but often it founders on uh, well, what is the ask, right? <laughs> Because uh, it's not like we need nicer lunch bars, right? Uh, and so instead, uh, you know, I wonder if there's some role for these kinds of ethical questions to be part of unionization in tech. Uh, and I think, by the way, I think, again, that's something the window for that is narrow because VC is getting into the space in a big way. And VC has a way of being, frankly, corrosive to values, right? Um, and, and that's where, again, I think it's very interesting that this is being hosted by an EU entity with EU government backing, because I think that's the other route besides collective action is uh, government stepping in to help solve some of these kinds of collective action problems. In a way, by the way, that was impossible in early open source, because in early open source, if we'd walked into Congress and said, hey, all this software should be free, they would have said, who are you? Why are you here? Uh, and, and what is software anyway? AI, you know, has more influence right now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the fear, uh, the fear, the concerns, uh, it's the, the debate is very clear in, in policymakers uh, mind, like, and you can tell at least in Europe and well, in Europe, China, definitely and, and the United States, I don't know about the rest of the world. And but I want, I want to go back to one other uh, one other conversation that I think it's worth uh, following as an example is the whole debate around the clause non commercial inside the Creative Commons packages that for handling, uh, because that's another place, another framework, if you want, where there's been a huge amount of debate about interpreting that rule, what does it mean uh, over the world, because Creative Commons tries to be, uh, tries to apply to, to the rest of the world, and, and tries to stick to copyright, which is sort of, kind of has a worldwide uh, acceptance level. Um, 
but uh, any any anywhere you step up beyond uh, co strictly copyright or the Berne Convention, then you start stepping into uh, changes and differences in in between United States, UK, continental Europe, and and other legislation. Um, the the fear that I have about thinking in in uh, I mean the the debate specifically around Creative Commons non commercial has been so. Uh, so harsh and, and so difficult and, and has split so many, uh, destroyed so many friendships <laughs> uh, that that I, I really wish we can we can have a nicer conversation this time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, the, it, that, Stefano, that also reminds me of the open database license, right? Mm -hmm. uh, database law, for those who are not familiar, uh, and this is what Stefano was alluding to, Copyright law, all countries in the world are signatory to the Berne Treaty. So if you write a copyright license, it more or less works the same way everywhere. A database license, which is what we tried to do for OpenStreetMap, which is sort of like a Wikipedia for maps for those not familiar with it, uh, trying to write that on database law, which is not global, which is not universal, uh, it turns out that is very hard. And, um, and it leads to situations where big entities have figured out the loopholes and exploit it. Whereas good faith nonprofit entities do not abuse those loopholes, do not exploit it. So again, they are actually fighting with one hand behind their backs, which is an un, which was an unintended side effect of writing a complex license. Uh, again, which isn't to say I helped write that one. I only apologize for it so much. So um, you know, so I think it can be done, but it is it's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. So we have five minutes. So maybe concluding remarks, then uh, we'll we'll wrap up. Uh, uh, Danish, you want to um, give some key takeaways and uh, how we have to go further from here, uh, based on your experience with uh, uh, Rail and other uh, community-based licenses. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one critical piece, and I think that's something we should focus on more, is is feedback, right? I think the way you know the the idea of Rail is not new. People have tried usage restrictions in the past. Um, with open source licenses, some have been uh, very broad. They are do no evil, which is very highly you know, un unenforceable because you know you could always convince yourself that you're not doing evil, um, and that gave you know licenses like this a bad name in the past. And I think we we tried to learn from that experience, um, engage with the open source community to also understand their concerns, and come up with some initial versions of what that could look like, right? And I think we're now at a stage where. Uh, taking this forward is is important, right? There are many aspects to this. Um, data was one aspect. Community norms for enforcement is the other aspect. Uh, standardizing language so that there are no legal loopholes. Uh, legal loopholes, maybe in different settings, could be one way of also um, channeling this forward. And I think we have to work together to at least try and see how this could work, right? There's no solution. I I wouldn't say that you know the licenses that we have today are perfect, or or you know th there are challenges with them, but I don't see them as unsurmountable, right? I do think there are um, ways even within the legal framework that exists today to work to work we'll work with them. Um, more so because, like I said, you know, going back to what I said, status quo is not tenable, right? We have to change um, something here. And it, it's just a matter of figuring out what that is. And maybe there is no one answer that fits all for everything. Data may need its own thing, model may need its own thing, software may need its own thing, and, and all of it needs to be aligned together. Otherwise, you've got these blocks that don't fit together or work together in one place. And, and you know, as, as even in the past, right, if, if software has been misused or has been used in ways that are, that, is, that are directly harming, I think one thing that's different for the AI is even notionally good usage can have bad influences just because of, of not re recognizing the limitations of that system. I think that's, that's, that's slightly different that needs to be, um, that, that we as, as, as the community and, and those developing licenses need to be a bit sensitive towards, sensitive, sensitive about. Because if, if my data has been sourced from a particular geography, it has certain limitations in terms of its bias. Now I've trained a model that's perfectly interpretable with uh, you know, everything that we've, we want to list in terms of best practices of machine learning deployment. And I then say, you know, just because it was sourced responsibly, it was built a certain way, maybe it's good for an end use, maybe it's still not, right? And which is why I think we need to think about usage, not just so from a, from a perspective of, you know, harm with the intent of harm, but the unintended harm with the intent of good, right? That, that, that could rise with the AI systems. You can't test them as effectively. You can't predict what the system is going to say. And that 
that leaves open questions. Even if you find a bug, you don't know how to fix it reliably like the way you would do this with traditional software systems. So that has changed quite a bit, right? And I think all of this needs to work together to um, to result in meaningful change um, with positive impact, right? Yeah. And, I, and I will pause there yeah. with that comment. Uh, Anlin, quickly, you want to uh, add something as a closing remarks? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to Louis's earlier point about like the challenges of writing a licensing that applies to multiple cultures. And say, I see that as a barrier, but I also see it as a mandate for us to work towards because different cultures, different regions, different communities have different perception of what's misused. And I think that's what we really need to grapple with to build up this licensing framework. Well, Louis? I'll just say, I, for all that I've said negative and, and that this is hard, and it's super important and it is so exciting for me to see people tackling it and taking it seriously. It's, it's just really heartening um, and I'm super excited to help however I can. Cool. Um, Nick? Yeah, just to keep it brief, uh, I'll just say that I really appreciated this discussion, uh, loved all the points and looking forward to the discussion going forward. Um, and then I guess my, my just like closing remark would be that I, I think that licensing is a really promising way to, to scaffold low cost collective action in a way it's, it's the state stepping in and helping to let people do this governance together in a way that, you know, maybe we can't do just by building, just, just building browser extensions isn't enough. We need to get the licensing involved. And so I'm very excited about that. Great. Stefano? Um, my, my closing remark, I would say that uh, be, let, 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 I, I be, start thinking about also uh, influencing the policymakers, like stepping outside of the labs and stepping outside of the uh, thinking about licenses as, a, as a, the only tool because there is more. I, I think policymakers need to be educated, they need, to be, they need to be taught, they need to be influenced, they, they, they need to be exposed to the dangers and risks. And, and maybe there are ways where uh, dangerous uses can be, can be regulated uh, at a higher level, at a different level. Uh, because the drawback and the, the trade-offs of putting, putting restrictions to the usage of data uh, since in a field that changes so much may leave the communities that we want to protect um, exposed to the risk of, of being um, in, in uh, hampered or damaged by the, the friction that we inadvertent, uh, you know, without meaning, uh, meaning it, uh, we have added. And, uh, and, and that friction can be removed by large corporations with money, like, you know, the, the Googles, the, the Facebooks, the, uh, they have all the data they need and they can license it for, uh, you know, they can enter into commercial agreement with each other and leaving the, the smaller communities, the research community with, with small data sets just because friction good <laughs> okay uh, so so i'm really enriched i think uh, um, we are we are going to stream this uh, on first uh, uh, of december so uh, i hope this is going to uh, you know continue our conversations for uh, further uh, events by hippo ai because this is the first edition um, of the hippo ai summit so we will have subsequent events uh, in the, in the first quarter of uh, uh, next year um, again so we hope to, again, be in touch with you all. Um, and thank you so much for your uh, insightful discussion and, and uh, really great inputs. Uh, yeah, we will, we will share with you the summary and, uh, yeah, the further uh, uh, communication. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.